On the Tape is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, and iConnections, reimagining how the investment industry connects. Welcome to the On the Tape podcast, Guy Dami, Dan Nathan, Danny Moses, together in the studio. Uh, how are you, Dan Nathan? Doing great. Danny Moses. Fantastic. I'm very excited for this podcast. There's a lot to discuss. It's the penultimate day of May. Second but to last. But as you're listening to this, it's the last day of May. Mm. But we're taping this on a Thursday, is our want to do. Mm-hmm. However, we had a great conversation yesterday, Dan Nathan. Why don't you tell the audience what they have in store on the flip side, on the B side, as they say. Yeah, this is a really interesting, I, I guess you'd call it market strategist, mm. um, somebody of, a, of the pundit class, Danny Moses. Um, this would be Kyla Scanlon. We found out about her. On the Twitter, yeah. guy slid into those DMs. No, no, no. Oh, stop. What are you talking about? I didn't about? slide into anything. <laughs> no, but I'm just <laughs> saying no, 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 that's how you can. sounds creepy. Okay, fine. She is a brilliant young woman. She just wrote a book. It came out this week. It calls In This Economy, How Money and Markets Really Work. Um, it just launched. It's a great, it's it's like a how-to mm-hmm. guy for the money and the markets. How that sort of thing. All right, here's the deal. You know what? But speaking of how-tos. Yeah. How to not bet on the Triple Crown. Here we go. Right. Yeah, no, we're not How going there. Not Save it for next triple- week. I'm going to okay, give you the fine, winner. In the All right, but here's the deal. So Kyla's book, it's just out uh, this week, and we're going to give away 100 free books. Leave a review in the podcast store. Take a screenshot. Email it to contact at risk reversal. We're going to send you a book. You guys know how to do it. We appreciate your participation. I think you'll love the book. And follow her on the socials. Why wouldn't you do Right that? after this conversation, Guy, me, and Kyla. Okay. Are you a fan? Okay, first of all, Danny Moses, yeah. as we've talked about a multitude of times, Athens, Georgia. Tunker down for me. Athens, Georgia. Yep. Some of the great bands of all time have yes, come have. out of Athens. We've yes. talked about yes. this. Yes, REM, R-E-M is one widespread of my panic, bands. yes. So you know this. Don't say B-52s, I but please. I believe the Georgia going. satellites, yeah. B-52s as well, yeah. are from Athens, Georgia. I know, but I would not, wouldn't use them. Some bands are from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, I'm not going to play the game with you because it's very difficult. But two weeks ago, we had a conversation with Steve Eisman, and it and it shook me to my core. I like Steve, by the way. Yeah. You like Steve. Of we course. all love Steve. Yeah. The new Steve is fascinating. Regarding Henry, as I said, in, you know, from it's the funny movie. you say that. Yeah. Regarding, and you Re- brought that up. Yes. It was so a anyway. good. It was a great poll by the great Harrison Ford. Yes. Keep going. What? Please. Great movie. Yes. The band, The Replacements, yes. are from, you know this band. I do know this band. They put out an album in 1989. They were you in a may, movie. They were in a movie. The name of the album was Don't Tell a Soul. But the hit song off that album was, you know, I'll be you, I'll, you be me for a while and I'll be you. You be me for a while and I'll be you. Freaky and Friday. Me, Freaky Friday. Yeah. But I was thinking, you know, I want Steve Eisman to be me for a while and I'll be him Yep. because he's the happy Steve Eisman. And I threw everything I could. I threw the kitchen sink at him, right? You did. He doesn't we want all to see did. it. He doesn't, he doesn't want, want to, to hear it. He doesn't want to see it. He doesn't. He, don't tell us all. Once like, he gets, once he starts down that path again, I know I watched it. I've watched it. He but just, I he, want he him to be me for a while. Okay. And I'll be him. Okay. But I don't want it. But you understand what I'm saying? Your guys' wives would last 10 minutes with each other. You think spouse. so? Yes. I don't think it would go well. But it's fascinating yes. because he was so happy and you know we threw and all the things that you're concerned about that i'm concerned about dan as well are starting to play out over the last couple since basically he was on a lot of these things are picking up steam now i'm not here to cast aspersions on steve eisman he's a genius however the new and improved happy steve eisman i think danny is missing a lot of shit that's going on Thoughts. He knows everything that's going on. He just doesn't need to go there right now, and he doesn't want to bog his mind down because, to be fair, it's work to just be kind of true. Close, Truth, in, in, right? And he knows better than anybody debt structure, government's debt, the situation. So I'm not going to go there. Just know that he knows more than not that he's letting on that he wants to. And by the way, it's paid to do that for a little while. So until proven differently, I will say there's nothing knew that this stuff has been percolating for a long yes. time. This whole thing has been masked by a couple of themes in the marketplace and so forth, but things are in motion right now, 1,000%, and people need to wake up and recognize what these things are. And at the core, the economy is slowing. Inflation is not slowing as much. That's all you really need to know at this moment. That's the overriding factor to me with everything. And that being said, that's not enough for the Fed to necessarily, necessarily cut. And even if rate cuts start to get priced back in, it's just not going to have an impact on this is a 
15 20 year kind of unwind unwind trade in my opinion. I so. want to be ha- I want to be happy. Yeah. I want to be Steve Eisman happy. He had a big shit eating he was just a happy I guy. I know you're jealous. I'm great. jealous too. Yes. I'm I am jealous of that, but yeah. I'm not wired that way. Yeah. So Dan Nathan as we sort of get into this podcast and you have any interest in some of the things that we're talking about in terms of all the things that we threw at Steve a couple weeks ago again the s- things that you watch are well, all some and in listen, individual stocks, by the way, in spades. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I'll just say this, and, and we have friends who say this all the time: know who you are in the market. And mm-hmm. I think Steve and your team at Front Point knew who you were in that market. And, and again, it's been dramatized, you know, by the book, yeah. by the movie to some degree. But when I, you know, I've gotten to know obviously you very well and Vinny and Porter very well. I, I believe that you know uh, Michael Lewis, um, you know really did represent who you guys were in the markets back then. And, you know, I think, Guy, the most important point that I take away over the last, call it 15, 16 years from that, I think all of us have a little PTSD. And I think mm, I it, agree with it that. kind of, you know, it, 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 it kind of comes out in our, our commentary and the way we invest or trade, that sort of thing. And you can't shake that because after, you know, the dot-com bust, I, you know, headed into 2008, I still was reeling from some of the things that I learned there. And, you know, in some instances, it makes me a better trader and better investor, but in some ways it makes me a lot worse. And then throw on the punditry, and this is where I want to kind of tie it in back to Steve in a way, is that having to talk about markets as frequently as we do, and we've talked about this a little bit, it makes it that much harder to become or, or maintain being a good investor or a good trader, you know what I mean? Because you have to continue to adapt and it's sometimes relative to what you're saying in the markets. And I look at a guy like Steve, you know, it's funny, I went back after our conversation um, with him a couple weeks ago, he's been doing media since the book and the movie a lot, a lot more than you, I, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. And so in some ways, I think he really enjoyed it, but he's now a different market participant than he was back then, a very different market Listen, participant. Listen, the thing that's changed from when we were making that trade was Things traded on fundamentals then, mm-hmm. that things found their natural levels, price levels, that you know, so to speak. And that's changed. And that that's the one thing that you guys are forced to be on TV every day. Not forced, but you guys are on TV most days. You're doing market call every day. You call it as you see it. And in real time, as you're seeing things, you want to believe that the market is efficient and eventually things find their level, which they always do and they always will. But the government intervention post the big short era has muddied the waters on everything. And for some reason, there's a new generation, not for some reason, I can explain it. There's a generation of traders who don't know anything other than the government has your back, the Fed has your back, treasuries are the best asset class in the world, U.S. Treasury, and everything's going to be okay, and ignore that stuff until it matters. This wall is building. This dam is going to break at some point. And the problem is when it breaks, what are the levels for certain prices of various assets? Yeah. Where do they go? But I can tell you guys that watching and i've paid much more attention to commodities in the last five years more than i did because it really didn't mean as much obviously bonds always meant so come on there is something you know funky going on there are several different themes being played out in the market and they're not all bullish they don't point to a situation where things are going to be okay so i just think we get closer and closer to the time and maybe it'll actually be when the fed actually cuts and the market doesn't respond in a positive way because everybody has had this large anticipation it's quote a sell on the news event i don't know but we're seeing in real time. We're going to talk about some of these names. These, if you if you underperform or miss a number, God forbid, as a, in a quarter, you're going to get punished. And what it tells you, guy, though, is that stocks were at levels that they didn't deserve to be, only because higher prices begets higher prices, and then bam, elevator uh, staircase up, elevator down. So we're seeing that in in many asset classes. This guy. is a holiday shortened week, but a few things happened this week that I found interesting, Danny. You probably do as well. So there is price discovery still in a few different places. One of them happens to be in these treasury auctions that happen from time to time. And we saw two this week. Neither one of them were particularly good. Yields. We're, we're taping this on Thursday, and we've seen yields go from 462, 463, back down about 455. However, Danny, my point is. You're seeing truth in the form of these bond auctions, and they're not going well. And, you know, we've beaten Japan to death, but very quietly, their 10-year yields now above, I think, 1.05%. In addition to, their currency continues to weaken as we're sitting here either side of 157. Neither of those are a good thing. But treasury auctions, there is price discovery. 
and I don't think people are liking what they're discovering. Yeah, well, let's just talk about yields and, and when they finally, let's say, Fed funds is lowered, as you just kind of alluded to. I mean, I have a chart sitting in front of me here on my fax set machine showing the last few times that we've paused, okay, after a rate hiking cycle. And when they start to cut, it's been a disaster for equities. So you tell me, with the S&P at 52.50, trading at about 20 times, which is higher than the 10-year average, about 19 times, and 18 times for the five-year average, when we start to cut, whether it's because GDP is slowing, you know what I mean, and, and, and you know, like 1.3% is nothing. We were at 2.2% in the 10 years prior to COVID, right? So let's just say they start to cut in reaction to that from five and a half with inflation still above 3%, that is still very accommodative, right? So if they start to cut because the economy is weakening, you think stocks, you don't think there's going to be an earnings recession. You don't think that, the, that, you know what I mean? Like the slowdown is not going to be the thing that you want to buy the stock market above 5% uh, 5 or above 5,000. The, the point the guy just made, so you got for three days, we're trading on supply and demand of treasuries. Mm -hmm. And then in one day, it's all about supply and demand. One day there's demand created because GDP is revised lower and the inflation rates are a little bit lower. To your point, Dan, which I just said before, the trade-off between the Fed cutting one time and a sled on the economy, what that means to earnings, this is not a market that's trading at a 15 or 12 PE. It's a market that's trading at a 20 to 22 time P on the S&P that is very top heavy, very secularly driven. And you know what? They've earned that because you've seen huge numbers come out of some of these large, large companies. But that's my whole point. You know, the, the people that are getting sucked in are the belief that the Fed's going to quote, save the day. And let me just say something else ahead of this rate rally, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that. QT does get tapered starting Monday. Mm -hmm. So the runoff is going to be less. It's not $60 billion anymore. It's 25 you got buybacks from the Treasury have been buying back certain bonds that are out there. So there are artificial things or technical things that are going to be going on, which can explain some of that. And if the PCE number, which we sit here today, will be out tomorrow morning, is better than expected, meaning more dovish, meaning lower than expected, the number, certainly you can get a little bit of follow through. But I, again, I think, and I've been saying this, I think this is all just kind of noise and earnings and fundamentals matter in companies. And if you're not performing now as a company, if you are, you know, if you can't get it right right now in the, literally the greatest tail in the greatest economy of all time, that's not a stock that you want to own. So you want to own the, truly want to own the. Well, we have some examples of it. Okay, so, so if you're saying that the market has been driven by a secular shift. We all know what that secular mm -hmm. shift is, right? It's infected valuations. It's infected yeah. large parts of the market. But I'm looking at a part of my um, you know, main screen that has probably 300 tickers on it, and I see Salesforce.com down 21.5%. Yep. This is a $200 billion market cap company, right? This is what you would call AI adjacent. They started telling a story about how they will use generative AI back in early 2023. Adobe is down five and a half percent. It's down 25 and a half percent on the year. This was a company that was trading, you know, I don't know, five percent from its all time highs last summer of 2023. And this was also supposed to be AI adjacent, deploying generative AI across their products and services that are basically licensed, you know what I mean, by the seat and that sort of thing. And the list goes on and on, you know, of these, la these SaaS names that were the darlings of this last cycle. They are not participating. Snowflake is down nearly 30%. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I guess my point is, if you're not looking at the performance of some of those names and you are still really excited about the picks and shovels, okay, mm -hmm. of generative AI, then you're missing the boat right here because enterprise spending is coming in. And that's what these enterprise software companies are telling you. And we might see it next in the hardware by the time you're listening to this. Let's see what Dell has right. to say. You know, that sort of thing. So to me, I think the writing's on the wall for a slowdown in enterprise spending, regardless of what the economy does. What's fascinating to me, and Danny made the point, and you just sort of gave some granular examples, Dan, is the fact that if you miss even in the slightest, mm -hmm. you're getting punished. And I will tell you, you know, the Salesforce quarter, I didn't think it was a disaster. I didn't think the guidance was a disaster. But obviously, the stock reaction is a disaster. And by the way, we had pointed out the potential for a double top in the stock back in March of this year, that came to fruition, and we're starting to see the follow through now. But even the slightest misses are being really taken out to the woodshed. And I think that's a bit of a warning sign for sure. And I don't think the beats are probably to the magnitude that we've seen before in terms of stock performance to the upside is not there either. So there's certainly some things going on here under the surface. And on top of that, and Danny, you were talking about this, the retail space, I find fascinating. And again, the health of the U.S. consumer and 
We hear that all the time. The U.S. consumer is in a great spot. And quite frankly, I'm not certain that's the case, number one. But just through the lens of some of these stocks, the fact that Walmart continues to do what it does speaks to probably why the consumer is not in a great spot and why Walmart, more than anybody, is positioned to take advantage of this. And the flip side of that coin, these dollar stores, Dollar Gen specifically today on this Thursday, which continue to trade really poorly. Yeah. Let me talk about Salesforce for a minute, and then I want to go into yeah. retail. So it, really interesting on Salesforce. Um, activists have been circling this thing for over a year, and they kind of went went by the wayside when the stock made its way back up to kind of $300, right? You got ValueX, Starboard, Elliott, they were in there. They wanted either a succession plan for Benioff, right, or they wanted gross margins to keep improving. What does he do last quarter? Not this quarter, last quarter. He instates a $0.40 cent dividend, quarterly dividend. We've always said when you're instating a dividend, you want to the growth question is, the multiple, the, right? Growth. The, the, the and then he added $10 billion to his buyback. Well, guess what? He just brought the activists all back into play. And I'm just pointing that out in the sense of companies will do what they need to do, right, in order to stave off or stay, in, stay independent and maybe keep these sharks at bay. But he's out of ammunition. So there's something that's going to happen in Salesforce. But just watch what companies do and the reason, reasons that they do it. And again, Salesforce was a roll-up story. Mm -hmm. you know, they've made acquisitions forever. And I think they finally lapped. These large acquisitions, of course, Slack was the one people hated that they overbid. Yep. Anyway, retail. As I just said, if you're not performing now in retail, hey, Macy's, are you listening to me? Sell your company. Just go to the activist and call their bluff. If there's an activist right now in a retail company that's not working, I say hit the bid, right? Because if your merchandising's wrong at this point, you're not going to, in my opinion, have really time to change your mojo. But it is amazing between the American Eagles and Abercrombie's, so between right. the Foot Lockers and the Coles, between, if you want to throw retail, Walmart and the Targets, between it is the consumer is being very, very selective, and you've got to follow those trends. So these aren't, my, I guess my point is this I don't buy the dip in retail perspective on a company that's kind of headed in the wrong direction. It's going to be very hard to turn those around. My point with what's going on right now in real time with what we think the consumer is facing, which we continue to see are more and more headwinds, nothing catastrophic. But more headwinds, and I don't see that abating. I'll well, just say real quickly, I think you're spot on in your assessment there. Retail is one space where, you know, historically we talk about catch-up trades and, you know, at some, part, at some point Target's going to catch. I don't think that's really the case. I think the winners are going to continue to win in the form of Walmart and some of these other names, and the losers are going to continue to lose. And I think that gap is just going to continue to grow. So as opposed to some sectors where maybe you can buy weakness in names that haven't performed, I think this is one where you want to stay with the winners and avoid the losers. And there's winners and there's losers. Ain't that America? We might have a title for there's winners and losers. Ain't no big well, deal. I mean, ain't no big right. deal. Because a simple portfolio manager buys the stocks Danny's, that work. I love when you anyway, say. Anyway, we have a title. We didn't have so a theme this yet. is yeah. something, uh, back to the consumer for a second. There was an article in Bloomberg. This was on Wednesday. Uh, it was entitled, Not Going to Be Pretty. COVID era home buyers face huge rate yes. jumps. So they're talking about adjustable mortgages. They said there's 100 or 1.7 million owners of homes bought since 2019 with adjustable rate mortgages. And they're talking about when they readjust. You're, you're giving me a little... No, it's uh, not a crazy... It's not like it used to be. It's not a huge percentage. Well, understood. But, yes. but when you're thinking about uh, if you were a buyer during COVID, right, like you basically had to put some cash down, right? Yeah. It would draw down some savings. And now all of a sudden, you're readjusting after four or five years at a much higher rate. It's just going to... It's the same way we were talking about student loans having to be repaid or whatever. On the margin, it's just not good, right? We know we've been drawing down on those COVID savings. So again, let's see what happens. Some of these, comp uh, some of these, uh, you know, buyers might be able to do home equity loans because the values are that. That's much what higher. I was going to say. The values are probably up. Yeah. But yes, you're right. It yeah. does not help on but the margin. It's not a positive. You're right. It's not great. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. The other thing I want to talk about is the energy space. Which, listen, we're talking about crude oil, which is can't get out of its own way. I mean, I think as we're sitting here, crude's probably trading seventy eight and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. Ish. So it's been sideways to lower now for quite some time. And the stocks, look, XLE had a tremendous run, traded back up to those prior highs. I think that was like 98 or so. That's giving some of it back. With all that said, you're still seeing M&A in the space, Danny. And we saw, we heard about it earlier this week in the form of ConocoPhillips and Marathon Oil. Not Marathon Petroleum, Marathon Oil, as we used to say, MRO kind. An all-stock deal, I want to say it was $14 billion. I might be off by a couple billion. That's not the point. The point is there's still value in the space and the confidence that these companies have to go and make acquisitions like this, to me, I think speaks volumes as to why um, people are not just giving them their just due. And I think energy is still in play here. I agree. And I actually think that 
you said oil can't find its way for these companies just being flat i think is a positive in terms of valuation and i think there'll be a source of of buying from from selling other asset classes potentially whether that would be tech or coming out of retail whatever it might be because the stocks are cheap and to your point these balance sheets certainly when you put them together just get stronger and stronger i'm surprised we haven't heard more from the ftc recently i mean the exxon deal obviously closed and went through chevron the shareholders just approved that deal you know with hess i think they're finally going to get that whole thing squared off um and now you got more deals and these aren't small deals right and we talked about this as a theme Last year, we've been talking about this, that M&A, energy M&A is going to be a theme, and I don't see it stopping anytime soon. And it's really interesting. I think that oil obviously trades between economic activity and tension in the Middle East. And so you get this, you get this push and pull, I think, continuously happening. It's probably priced evenly. I think we need, we need to get Halima back on here soon to talk about this stuff. Obviously, there's huge meetings coming up around mm-hmm. the world as it relates to oil. So we'll see what happens. But I think from a stock perspective, Guy, if you told me 78 to $80 or even 75 to $80 West Texas, I, I think- yeah, I, think the, you're, I think you're right. I think the price is not as important as people think. Yet, as we all know, the individual equities trade on the back of that. But with all that said, there's so many interesting cross currents. And I'll just throw this out there, Dan. I still believe that if we ever see a sell-off in technology, if, it's a big if, Sort of like we saw in April, but you're going to see, I think that mar- that money is going to find its way, not predominantly, but in large part into the equity, into the energy space. Yeah, I, th- I think we're on the precipice as, as far as like the last major announcement in generative AI. So so again, if we're talking about where rotations happen, where money comes out of tech and into other sectors, I'm going to leave that to you guys. Um, I just feel pretty confident that June 10th, Apple has their worldwide developers forum. Prior to that, it's been rumored that they are going to make an announcement licensing OpenAI's technology. They're going to do stuff on the edge, which means on their devices, but they're also going to be, you know, just cleaning up a bit of Siri and some of the other things, you know what I mean, that they have not been that great at and they need to better compete with some other hardware uh, manufacturers like Samsung and the like. So to me, let's see how Apple, which is just about to be overtaken by NVIDIA and market caps, which is truly astounding. NVIDIA started 2020 with 140 billion market cap. It right now is on the cusp of hitting $3 trillion in market cap. And we get it. We know why. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, I get it. This company went from $10 billion in sales to over $100 billion in sales in a matter of a few years. And the margins have gone up considerably from you know under 70 to the high 70s and all. But just as far as, Guy, you bring up this point all the time, this is one of the biggest secular shifts that any of us can remember in tech really since mobile, social, cloud. That was about 15 years ago. And then Email 15 years prior to that, it was the internet, right? But here's the thing about the internet, people. And here's the thing about cloud and mobile and social and all that. They all failed massively. There was a huge, you know, uh, like drawdown in demand at some point, not far off from the peak in euphoria about the investments. And that's the only point I want to make. And the narrower and narrower this tech trade becomes, it's the more risky it becomes when it finally comes undone. And, and we have not even seen a recession that most, not just us, most people were calling for, right, at the um, better part of 2022. The last thing before I take a breath, and I'm going to leave it to you guys, is some of the most beloved stocks in the stock market. From the end of 2021, when the Fed signaled that they were going to start to raise interest rates, these were the long duration names. And they're the same long duration names that exist right now that we had Meta, we had Netflix, we had NVIDIA, we had Tesla. They all sold off 75% from their highs, okay? And then there was no shortage of names that sold off 50 to 60%. So to think that that can't happen again because this secular shift is so much better than metaverse. It's so much better than cloud and mobile. It's so much better than the internet is absolutely ridiculous. And so that's why Apple, what they announce and how the market reacts to that on June 10th, I think is gonna be a very important week. Well, I, I, I'm just going to throw this out there, and and with the caveat that I've missed at least the last 100% in NVIDIA, which is remarkable if you think about it, but I'll just throw this out there with that caveat. They're out earning their revenue stream, and what does that mean? It means on a price-to-earnings basis, it's actually a very reasonable stock. So if you just look at it through that lens, you say, actually, it makes a lot of sense. The problem is at $3 trillion, they're trading close to 20, little less than 20 times next year's revenue, which historically in that sector specifically is extraordinarily expensive. So what's going to happen? What do I think? Well, 
at a certain point, it's going to catch up to them, probably in the form of margin compression. So that's been my concern, unfounded as it might be. That's been my concern, Dan, and that will continue to be my concern. Hey, Danny, I'm going to tee you up right here. There was a headline, um, I think it was this morning, that BYD, which just overtook Tesla in China. You know the, okay. you know about the car they can drive from New York to Florida 1, on one charge? 1,300 miles. Yeah, I saw it. It okay. came out the other day. So yeah. it's really interesting to me. Um, this is also at a time where Musk has done a total about face. Do you remember on the Q4 call in late January where Musk said, if there are not you know, some sort of market restrictions, and he was speaking to tariffs on Chinese EVs yeah. that they are going to demolish everything. And over the last week, he's done an about face on that, which Does I think is really interesting in a way. So BYD has overtaken them in China. They know, you know, Gigafactory is huge for them, not just for manufacturing for cars that they sell in China, but also into Europe and other parts of the world. And, you know, he went over there about a month ago, right, and met with that premier and he got some sort of assurance by full self-driving. Well, you know what's interesting? The stock rallied on that. You know that it's come in, what, about 15% or so. Can't get out of its own way. I just think that story is really interesting. And then lastly, you saw this uh, report in the Wall Street Journal earlier this week that he's been cozying up to Elon Musk. And I'll just say one you mean point. To Trump. Uh, he's been cozying up to Trump. And one of the things that's really interesting about that is that they are on the opposite sides of EV credits. They are on the opposite sides of tariffs with China. And they're on the opposite sides of how cozy he is with the Chinese premier and some of these other folks. So when I read that story, I just say, oh my goodness, like this woke mind virus that he seems so obsessed with has really polluted his brain. Yeah, I think that they both do what's in their best interest. They really don't care about any of that stuff. They flip on a dime because whatever's in the best interest at the moment. You had Musk that was an advisor to Trump originally and then said, if you leave the Paris Climate Accord, I'm leaving. Yep. And so he left, but then he comes out, he does, he's doing China's bidding right now, whatever's in that moment in time. But let's be clear, he, want, he needs protection from whoever the next administration is. So if he senses that, that Biden's going to win, you're going to see him oh, you know, willing to do something there. So they both do stuff within their self-interest. So to me, that's just noise. But yeah, they can have each other as far it's as I'm concerned. I mean, and I'm not looking to beat this person up, and it just goes to show how humbling the market can be. But, you know, Kathy Wood's ARK ETF, she owned NVIDIA. Good for her. Of course, she sold it, I think, between November and December, which was the exact wrong time to sell. And this is the innovation ETF. But it was announced earlier this week that she took a stake in a company called UiPath. The symbol there is PATH. And again, path just, to destruction. Well, path to yeah. destruction because the <laughs> stock today is down 34%. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Which is amazing if you think about it. And the now, CEO left. And yes. Okay. So, Other than that, I think it was a pretty good. Quarter. Well, you know, her entry yeah. point leaves a little bit to be desired. It, I, look, it sounds like I'm a hater. I'm not a hater. But when you talk about this market, I mean, she is heralded as one of the smartest investors in the world. Yet if you look at the performance of the ARK ETF since over the last two and a half years, I mean, it's gone absolutely nowhere well, on a broader market that's done extraordinarily Let's just well. look at the top 10. Tesla, Coinbase, Roku, Block, UiPath, Roblox, Robinhood, CRISPR, Zoom, Palantir. It is the island of misfit toys. Other than Coinbase, um, I'm hard pressed. Robinhood has had a little bit of a run, but it's not even that big of a position. I mean, these are some of the worst performing stocks over the last two or three years. And I don't know how she's still in business, to be honest with you. Well, I mean, she tells a great story. But again, I mean, as I say all the time, price is truth and people get mad at me for that. But the truth is manifesting itself and again, the ARKK, I mean, you can look at, we'll put it in the show notes maybe if we still do things like yeah, that. Yeah, we have show notes still. It's, it's been abysmal in a way. Danny, near and dear to your heart, by the way, is private credit. And it's a lot Near and going, dear to my heart. I mean, what does that mean? It is, well, I don't want to say you're a fan of it, but so, a, a something topic, I'm watching. A topic that you're passionate about. Should yeah. I rephrase? Yeah, it's sort of, yeah, near and dear I'll to my rephrase my question. Yeah, yeah. Please. Rephrasing Goldman Sachs, Overruled. Goldman yeah. Sachs, a little bit of a foray. Into, yeah. A lot of people, you're you one of them. I mean, th thinks there's some things hiding, it, not hiding, but percolating in private credit that might be of concern. Yeah, I think that um, you know, no one's reinventing the wheel here. It's, no, it's still lending, right? <laughs> we, we we know what it is, but the problem here is that where does most of these, where do most of the funding, sorry, 
where does most of the funding of this private credit come from? It's retail investors yeah. now. Guess what you get to do? You get access to some of the greatest companies in the world. They're private companies. We're going to give you seven, eight, nine percent. You get, you know, and they're like all excited, right? That so you have. Is two, it really you, retail though? I, a lot of like, there's the a Goldman, lot of this new Goldman Fund, twenty one billion. I, like what percent? I'm just curious because I'm there, assuming it's a lot of. There are a lot of institutional money, like, but there's a lot of retail money that's coming, yeah. like high net worth money that's mm-hmm. come in, and they're selling them on all their. And on all their offerings and so forth. So right. Goldman is, you know, obviously some firms are going to be better than others at it. They're on their way to three hundred billion. They just raised another twenty-one billion. I think they're over a hundred billion. And there are positives. I mean, there's yeah. there are going to be some good loans that are out there. But Jamie Dimon, maybe he's a little bit jealous of the growth in private credit around and feels like he's missing the boat. He actually made a point to say, I've seen a couple of these deals that were rated by a rating agency, and I have to confess, it shocked me when they got rated. Right. So he's, you know, obviously making a point, and people are like, oh, he's just what. But again, it is true. So you're going to have deals that don't go well, obviously, that blow up in private credit. But you could argue it's it's so there's so many loans that are out there that it, you you won't see it yeah. all in one shot. But I think I want to. Th- this is my takeaway from it: the Federal Reserve and the Treasury cannot track credit like mm-hmm. they were used to. So the banks themselves, which were always an indicator, right, of loans, right, a lot of the stuff is out of the. It's in the non-bank system, and I think. That's a thing that you have to watch. That being said, there's obviously great loans that are out there. So, so we'll put this article in the show notes. It's from Bloomberg. Uh, you know, Jamie Dimon said there could be hell to pay, particularly as retail clients gain access to the booming asset class. This is quoting him. Do you want to give access to retail clients on some of these less liquid products? Well, the answer is probably, uh, but don't act like there's no risk with that. And so, again, Guy, you've made this point on many occasions. I mean, Jamie Dimon, whose stock obviously was at new all-time highs right prior to uh, announcing their Q1 earnings on April 12th. Stock, you know, gap lower, okay, 6.5%. It was a, that was a massive move yeah. for the largest bank in the world, but it very quickly filled in that gap and then made new all-time highs. And the point you've been making is every time he opens his mouth, he doesn't sound particularly optimistic versus a split screen of Brian Moynihan yeah. who was speaking at the Bernstein conference today. And I, if I had a dollar for every time he says how resilient the consumer is, you know what I mean? It just seems like those two have been opposite sides of rates of the consumer and obviously of how they kind of manage their um, assets uh, on the balance sheet. Well, I mean, I'll say this at the risk of either one of them hearing it, but Brian Moynihan is sort of the Roger Goodell of the banking system, somebody that's just extraordinarily in over their head, but gets extraordinarily overpaid for doing it. So good for both of them, number one. Number two, it's remarkable to me how negative, how cautious Jamie Dimon's been now for the better part of two years. It can't goes two weeks ago, Danny and I had this conversation, Jamie Dimon basically saying that, and I'm paraphrasing to a point, they were no longer going to be buying J.P. Morgan stock back at these levels because, quite frankly, it's too expensive, which I happen to agree with. By the way, it hasn't affected the stock at all, really hasn't moved since he said that, for better or for worse. But he is absolutely... Uh, painting a bit of a cautionary tale. And again, he continues to talk about interest rates and his concern that rates are going higher than people think. I agree with him as, with that as well, Dan. Listen, the one thing I just want to add, that, and it relates to J.P. Morgan in the banking system, when I was talking about interest rates earlier and what can Fed and Treasury do, I've mentioned this now for a year. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. This SLR, the supplementary leverage ratio, right, is going to get relaxed like it did during COVID because at some point, the Fed and Treasury are going to realize that they need the big banks to be able to hold these bonds without, you know, getting the impact that they have from a leverage perspective. So I just wanted to throw that in there. I'm sure he would agree to that, that that will happen. And I'm, I'd be interested to see what the market thinks of that, yeah. even if the market picks up on it. Are you a fan of the state? of You go to Chicago from time to time. Yeah, CME. We might, are, I'm, I'm, I love Chicago. Hold on. And we yeah. went to, we saw Pearl Jam, and I'm going back in August, September taking my son 5th. to Wrigley Field. Hey, I'm going August 31st. That's right, 29th. You're going, August, right. 29th. Oh, 29th. You're going yeah. the Thursday. So you're both going to be, you're going to be in Chicago. Again, for PJ, for Pearl Jam. Yep, exactly. But my son's going back to school for senior year, so I'm going to going back. Of course. There. Okay. Illinois. Yeah. Well, great he's in Wisconsin, Illinois. but Illinois is great. Yes. Well, I only mentioned that because some news came out of the state of Illinois. Oh, I'm week. well aware of what I know, happened I know there. you are. Now, I'll say this. Yeah. DraftKings, DKNJ, had a G. monster run. G. DKNG. DK. Right. You Donkey said J. Kong. It's okay. I didn't say J. Okay. I said roll D- the tape. All right. Oh, keep roll, going. roll the tape. Go ahead. DKNG. Yep. As in guy. Yes. Stock had a huge run. I mean, the stock from last summer when it was 25 basically doubled. Went from 25 to 49 and a half. Yeah. I'm rounding up. Uh, it's now trading 35 and change in large part due on this news out of Illinois about taxation 
with representation or without representation, <laughs> I don't There's know. representation but, there. But I'll say this. J.P. Morgan came out today being Thursday and say you have to buy the weakness here Correct. in DraftKings. So there's two stocks. There's DraftKings and Flutter, which is FanDuel. F-L-U-T, which I've talked about ad nauseum. Flutter, just so, as we see here today, tomorrow gets listed on the New York Stock Exchange. They're dual listed. They're now making their home list in New York, which means all the funds are going to have to buy it, which means if you're listening to this on Friday morning, if you're picking one or the other, Flutter is cheaper, F-L-U-T, much cheap, cheaper than DraftKings. So what happened? State of Illinois is a huge market for the gambling space, and the tax rate there had been 15% on the online gambling companies. All the jurisdictions around the country range from as low as 10% to as high as 51% in the state of New York. So these companies have been managing kind of this tax arbitrage for a while. And I actually mentioned it on CNBC Fast Money in February mm -hmm. that one of the risks was Pritzker was talking about 35% tax. So anyway, make a long story short here, you're talking about a pretty decent impact, apples to apples, from 15% up to what is scaled up to 40. So call it blended for these two companies, DraftKings 36, FanDuel 37% uh, is what it would look like in Illinois. The impact could be as much as $100 million to, to FanDuel and maybe 50 or, you know, 50 or so to DraftKings. What does it mean? It means that the companies will adjust their marketing spend in those states. It means that if you're a resident of Illinois, look out because the parlays you're about to get offered and the over-unders are going to be much worse from an odds perspective. Mm -hmm. So the House did pass it, what the state Senate did, so it is looks like it's going to get signed into law. Mm -hmm. It's a buy it's a buy the dip mentality. It's still a strong macro sector, you know, very, very strong macro sector. So I'm a big buyer of these stocks on weakness. And listen, you're getting you'll end up getting Texas, you'll get California. Could other states follow suit? And, and and raise taxes? Yeah. Maybe. But the growth, I think, outweighs the well, tax. Well, this is burden. something that dogged Amazon for years, if you guys recall, like the collection of, um, you know, sales tax. And it was something that a lot of folks, it was like a pillar of the bear case for a long time. And if you go back and look, when they started in 2017, I think, collecting um, sales tax, the stock, you know, ended 2016 around 40 bucks. It closed uh, 2017 at 60 bucks. The by the next year it was at 100. dollars You know what I mean? So sometimes when some of these things are so well telegraphed, and to your point, companies they knew this was coming. Yeah, right? they, this was floated in February. They've right. been lobbying like crazy. Hey, maybe you could say the lobbying costs offset some of the other costs at the end of the right. day if they just start managing their their company towards that sort of expectation. But I'm definitely a buyer of weakness here on those two names, but Flutter over DraftKings, if I have to be specific. Here. You mentioned um, the Belmont Stakes. There's a break no, in you, between. No, you mentioned, oh, I mentioned the, yeah, you I mentioned the Triple Crown. Yeah. So I won't, hopefully we'll do a Next little Next week bit. we'll have a preview. I'll be there. I was going to say. You're going to be up there. You're going to be yes, up at Saratoga. Saratoga. Yes, yeah, so I'll be there. Now I'm going to apologize to some of the horse racing fans. I did not know, and we mentioned this last week, you and I, that they were not running a mile and a half at Saratoga, and you pointed out the reasons why. So right. I thank you for no that. No problem. What makes it Rarely do you admit that anybody's thank you for any information and told you anything that you didn't know. And I mean that, well, because well, rarely, it's very I rare. Just, you yeah. know, the, the beauty of the Belmont Stakes yeah. is the distance of the race. Yeah. But then you pointed out that you the can't track start on a turn. Support it. Correct. So you don't want to do that to the jocks and to the horses, really the and horses. to the trainers and the, the whole crew, yes. which I totally understand. Yep. But it's obviously a much different race up at Saratoga. It's but I only fantastic. mention that because I'm hoping, maybe against hope, that you'll handicap that much better. I'm guaranteeing I win this. There's okay. not even a question. And I'm, Dan gave me $100 and basically literally, he better off lighting oh, it on fire. Yeah. Yeah. However, yeah. you're getting a free $100 credit with me. Really? That's yeah. like DraftKings. This is like DraftKings. Yeah, you're amazing. getting a credit with me. Yeah. I'm going to ride it on the winner here. That. So when that, that happens next uh, week. There are winners in other places as well. Now, I put out recently my top five bands of all time. I don't okay. know if any of you are interested. If you are, I can rattle them off. I know what your number one is. So Please. Led, Led Zeppelin. Zeppelin. Yes, it is. Okay. Led Zeppelin is number one. Yeah. Rolling Followed Stone. closely oh, the by Who. The Who. Yeah. Then Rolling Stones. The Brothers Allman. Uh, yeah. Leonard Allman Skinner's Brothers. in there. No, they're not in the top five. Oh, really? Number four. You ready? Yeah. Rolling Stones. Yeah. And number five is, I think, the greatest front person in the history of rock and roll, Freddie Mercury of Queen. Yes. Why do I mention that? Tell I know me. why. Please. Because Sony is looking to buy their catalog How for much? $1 billion. $1 billion yeah. with a B. Do you have a piece of that? I feel like you should. I You've should. You've been such a big Queen fan. Well, there are four members of Queen, or there were four members of Queen. Yes. Obviously, Freddie Mercury passed away. Yeah. So his estate. So if they whack it up equally, I can do that math. Yep. That's $250 million a person. So to salute Brian May and the rest of the members of Queen. Yep. Because that's remarkable. And I am glad that they have, because they've been holding out. That's been their number. So it, a lot of these people that sold, you know, 300, 400 million, they got to be saying, wait a second, maybe we sort of, maybe we should have hung around a little bit longer. Is there a band out there, Dan Nathan? For example, 
Pearl Jam. Yeah. Have they sold their catalog yet? Not yet. I don't think. What do you think that's worth? I think it's easily. Hold on, I'll write it down. What, easily you're... a half a billion dollars. Right now, you think it's worth that much? Yeah. I think as long as they're still touring, it's well, not worth Well, can I tell you much. one reason why um, it's probably worth less? This is a band, okay, that puts out every single concert mm. that they do. And it's kind of like the Grateful Dead, where a lot of their fans love their live music. And so, like, for instance, you can get it on Sirius. You can get it on Nugs.net. So, for instance, that must depreciate, Danny, I, see, some, the catalog. No, I, I, you know what I think? Sense? No, there's not something really. else, though. The big thing is, once you're if you're still performing... Your value doesn't get to where it's going to get. Why is that? What if you do something stupid in society? What if something happens with yeah. Eddie? No, I'm just saying it yeah. would devalue potentially the legacy. Queen's done and dusted in terms of, you know, obviously. But, so before yeah. we get out of here, yeah. when I hear an Allman Brothers song, and I love the Brothers Allman, I would go march every year. My father was a gambler down Make the pilgrimage Georgia. those two weeks yeah. at the Beacon Theater. I was there for years, couple shows, each tour. It was okay. wonderful. And then you wake up and you put on the Yankee game, for example, and there's a GM commercial and they butcher an Allman Brothers song up in the background. That hurts me at a molecular <laughs> level. Okay. Because they- What was it? They sold out. What song was it? I want to say it's like Midnight Rider or something. Okay. Or, but the point is like, why? Well, hold why? on a second. Do you remember that scene with Jimmy Fallon in Almost Famous when they bring him in as the manager and he's, got, and he's got the plane and he's like, you got to get what, what you can get while the getting's good. And right. he goes, yes. if you think Mick Jagger at 55 is still going to be doing this, do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. It was amazing. He's 82 80. years old. Right. And I've heard people, they just saw him at Giant Stadium. Great. Okay. They were like, he was as good as when I saw him on Steel Wheels like 25 years ago or something like that, which is amazing. I guess I'll end him. by saying this. Are there, is everybody a sellout now? Um, are we the only ones left? Everybody has is a different everybody, incentive. Is everybody going just, everything's beautiful? Is that where we Dude, are in the world? guy, people think that if you're talking stocks on CNBC, you're a sellout. You know what I mean? Like, like, I'm you just saying, like, you know what I mean? Like, I try to speak truth to power. Yeah, I don't do. have the pom-poms. No, you don't. No, I don't. But And that, so you, you take but a I lot of hatred. You. You take a lot. I, I, you take a I, lot of hate. I, I like the hatred. I know. We, I, I, I know take you. it on. I. I you know, know this. You thrive on it. I thrive on you it. You do. It's my energy. It's like people drink those Red Bull things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my Red I love Bull. It. Never had one. All right, get us out of here, guy. I've enjoyed the conversation. I enjoy you both. I enjoy Yankee baseball right now. I really enjoy the fact that the Mets are in the shitter. And for you seven Met fans out there, I'm sorry. It will get better at some point, not in the foreseeable future. <laughs> But when we come back, as we mentioned earlier, Dan and I had a great conversation with Kyla Scanlon. So stick. No around. Ranger prediction for tonight's game. Are you crazy? Don't even make me do that. Okay, sorry, we're out of here. Not even okay. make me do that. All right. So what's that thing that we look at on the on the line that you meet people and you? Oh, the social media. Social media. Yeah, but yeah, there, yeah. the Twitter. Yeah. Oh, which the twi it's still Twitter. I don't look at that anymore. I do. I know you do. No, but there's certain people that you sort of res you 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 find you gravitate yeah. towards. Is that I, actually I true? That, yeah. Some some people you even slide into their DMs. I've never done that. Okay. Well maybe I have. I don't know. I don't but I don't do it in a creepy way. <laughs> no, not in a creepy way. I want to be clear about that. But Kyla Scanlon is one of those people. Yes. And she's brilliant. And her videos talking about economics and talking about all the different things that vibe we talk sessions. About. Excuse me? Yeah, well, she coined a phrase, the vibe session. Vibe We're going to get to that in the conversation. No, but I thought she's, I don't think, she's brilliant. She gets the medium. She's really good at it. She's written a book, and we thought it'd be great to have her on the podcast. So, well, by the Kyla, way, welcome aboard. Oh, thank you so much. Congrats on the book, Thank Kyla. you. It's called In This Economy, How Money and Markets Really Work. Um, talk to us a little bit about, like, how you came to write a book because to guy's point we kind of heard you on the twitter we saw you on the twitter you started writing for bloomberg mm -hmm. and doing opinion stuff i guess you were prolific on the tiktok guy <laughs> not on the tiktok, the TikTok i'm not no, i don't get no, the but, whole tiktok but, but, no, i know you don't yeah. but but she's doing amazing work there like all these different mediums and i yeah. think that's super and you have a podcast too yeah but, and a newsletter yeah and a newsletter oh, yeah. wow she's got all the bases so you got it and th you're a one person show effectively. Yeah. I mean, it is all you all the time. Mm -hmm. So Dan and I, at least are the two of us, and we have obviously people Great who work team. with us, but you know, it's pretty daunting to do what you're doing on a day to day basis. So I want to talk about the book, but how did you get immersed in this world? Um, oh, yeah. that, you know, we have obviously been in for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. So I started options trading in high school. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. My dad was like in, in options trading and he had just picked it up as a hobby. And I saw him do it and I was like, this looks really cool. And so 
I just sort of learned it all on my own. And um, then when I was in college, I had this blog called Scanlon on Stocks, where I talked about my options trading experience and then tutored and econ, et cetera. Um, but the blog was really fun. I wrote for Seeking Alpha. Like I was just wait, wait, so. Wait, in- did you watch Options Action on CNBC ever? No, because I thank I will- you for that. <laughs> you know well, no, I'm well, Melissa Lee is the host. Options Action was on. So you, you went to school in, in Kentucky. Yeah, I was so it's in Kentucky. On, I should know if it's the same time zone. I think it is. Then you're not one hour behind here, right? Yeah, uh, in Kentucky, no, no not it's the where same I live. So at five thirty on a Friday afternoon, she's not watching Options Action. What was she doing at four <laughs> twenty? What's four twenty? Oh, stop it! All right, so you started trading oh, oh, options. That's like a marijuana yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you okay. started trading options because your dad viewed it as a hobby. But did he? <laughs> did he? Did he take it seriously? Like, was it like a money making endeavor? Because guy and I, you know, we we've engaged with so many retail investors over the years through CNBC. Some really do treat it as a hobby. Like some people like to kite surf. Some people like to travel. You know what I mean? They allocate a certain amount of money. But other people really use it. Obviously, you know, their knowledge of that and and to. Make yeah. money like i'm just curious how how were you thinking about it yeah back then? so my dad didn't view it just as a hobby like he he's one of the smartest people i've ever met and he like is very good at it um but for me it was just a hobby because mm-hmm. i was not good at it and so it was just more a learning opportunity mm-hmm. for me like and it got me exposure to the market because growing up i like even when i got to school i had no idea you could major in finance and so it was just a really cool way for me to get exposure to a world beyond that of kentucky and it was it was really fun but that sort of sparked the interest in finance and then once I got to school and realized that you could major in finance, I was like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. How did the videos come about? How did you get comfortable hosting videos? Because again, Fast Money is five people every night for an hour. And if you start doing the math, you know, not, we're not going to be on for all that long a period of time. But when you're one person doing this, I mean, that's you. And you have, there has to be a level of comfort being in front of the camera and being able to be good at it. And you're both. So how did, you know... Was that a was that a learning curve? Or you just sort of were good at it from the start. No, if you scroll back to my earliest videos, like it's it's painful. <laughs> um, I have no idea what I'm doing, and that was like during the dawn of the pandemic too. Mm-hmm. So it was just it was tough. But then like the more, just I'm sure with fast money too, like you get used to it. You yeah. get used to talking. Um, I got used to very. I got very used to talking in a room all by myself to a screen. Um, but yeah, it was really just practicing scripts. And then I learned a lot from my audience too, like what they resonated with, what topics they wanted me to cover. And so that made it a little bit easier. Talk about your audience in terms of who's watching, how do you get the feedback? Is it email? Is it real time? You obviously, you said, you know, you take a lot of your cues from your audience. What do they want? Um, it's comment section. So underneath all the videos on Instagram and YouTube, and Twitter and uh, TikTok, people will tell me like what they're thinking about. And that's kind of where the idea of the vibe session came mm-hmm. from was I saw this like really uh, intense anger in, in my comment section. And so that's just where I'll kind of get a vibe from and, and see what people are thinking about and what they have questions on, which is kind of what you want to do as a content creator is like make content for the people who are watching your videos. It's interesting. So Guy and I are less in touch with our comment section. Yeah, that's probably um, good. I'll tell you, you know why that's probably that is? Better. Because you get I'm, fired a, up. I'm a Neanderthal. Yeah. 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 And I will search yeah. out the negative yeah. stuff in the comment section. He only sees the negative I'll stuff. I'll just actually. go only right after to- and they, they actually took it away from us. Yeah, we And did. it's actually probably- It was a good Bought thing. me a couple no, of days but, on my timeline. But, but it's interesting, you know, Kyla, like when you think about it, sometimes they can become echo chambers, right? Like yeah. for instance, someone's just sent me a link to Twitter. I've been basically off Twitter. I, some days I don't ever even open it. That's and nice. I opened it and I saw one of the first things that came up was a video of Guy and me on Fast Money from last night. So I clicked through it and I basically just saw, all I saw were negative comments. Like, like there was like, 15 negative comments. And then you ask yourself, why do you want to be here? Now, your thing is very different. You have a mission. You want to help teach people about this sort of stuff. So when you look at the comment section, just sometimes you feel like it's a bit of an echo chamber. Does that help influence you a little bit about some of the things that you're focused on? You understand what I'm saying? Is like, if everyone's pissed off because they're you know, like you, you talk about this vibe session. Um, does that make you feed the beast a little bit? You know what I mean? Oh, no. So, I mean, like my comment section is always negative too. Like I get yeah. death threats. Like it's awful. It's amazing. Um, but like I, I think like I, I, you're very aware as a content creator and like somebody who makes stuff online, if you make negative things, that's going to drive the beast even more like you're yeah. saying. And, and I try really hard not to do that. I try really hard to be objective, try not to have too much bias, even though, you know, I'm human and I do make mistakes sometimes. But um, yeah, it, it really is 
trying to move against that and show people the reality of the stock market, the economy, et cetera, rather than feeding preconceived notions that they might have about what's actually happening. Let's talk about the vibes. So here's my take on things. And you know, you you try to explain to people that the economy and the stock market are two different things. And I think to varying degrees of success, people get it. I think more so now than ever, people are really getting it. Because on the one hand, you have a stock market that's effectively at all-time highs. On the flip side, the Biden administration, and this is not political, but that's the current administration, and their approval rating on the economy is probably at record lows. So you have this huge disconnect, and I have trouble figuring it out. I think I sort of understand it, but you can understand, I think, why people are somewhat exercised in terms of trying to reconcile how can we be struggling so much with inflation and all the different things and the stock market's an all-time high. And that obviously can be infuriating for people. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's like part of the problem is that you, when you talk about the good economic data points, like new, there's a saying that nuance doesn't sell. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what happens because when you talk about the good economic data points, everybody has a very personal experience of the economy. Everyone has a personal inflation rate. Everyone has a personal you know, job experience, personal experience with GDP growth. And so when you sort of summarize economic data, it can feel like it is totally disconnected from you. And then in terms of the disconnect of the stock market and the economy, like the structural affordability problems that we have are like a housing crisis. Right. It's healthcare, it's elder care, it's child care. That's not always reflected in the stock market. And so that's, I think, where the disconnect comes from in a big way. Yeah. So this weekend, or I guess it was last week, you know, I knew you were coming on. You and I had met Guy yeah. and you had chatted online a bit. Yeah. And uh, I opened the New York Times on May 23rd and Paul Krugman, America is still having a vibe session. How did that feel mm -hmm. um, being quoted like that? I was super psyched because I was like, OK, you know what I mean? Not, not that, you know, Paul Krugman, uh, you know, again, I, I think some people love him. Some people don't love him so much. But. The article st uh, starts, and this is to Guy's point, if Donald Trump wins the election, the main reason will surely be that a majority of voters believe that America's economy is in bad shape. So all the work that you do, I mean, some folks consider you a strategist also. Um, do you agree with that assessment that um, the economy is in bad shape? You just alluded to a portion of the, um, let's call it consumers, uh, population, electorate, however you want to, who are having a difficult kind. Guy discusses this all the time. But for most of America, if you own a house and you don't have to refinance it, if you own stocks, um, we have record low um, unemployment. You know, I mean, there's a whole host of things that you can point to and say, wow, things are as good as they've been in a very long time. Where's the disconnect? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think things are like the economy is relatively pretty good. I think inflation has been a pressure cooker. Like it is really expensive to go to the grocery store. It, that hurts like when you get your grocery bill. Um, but I, I think a lot of people have maybe misaligned expectations or they're just frustrated. But like I, I think objectively the economy is good. Unemployment is at a record low. You know, we're not in a recession. The stock market is up over 10 percent on the year. Um, and I think for whatever reason, that's just not resonating with people. And it is the structural affordability problems. But we kind of have to move beyond that to recognize elements of reality. You know, you put out something last June, um, young, basically Young Investor's Guide to the Markets, which is, you know, good, amazing stuff, right? And at that time, according to the study, people's opinions on their finances, three quarters of the people feel great about their financial situation. I mean, that's a term that was used. However, they feel the economy is is horrible. I, again, it's like all these different. I know it's sort of the same thing over and over again. But you know, I'm 60 years old, and I think the last time I saw anything close to that was when I was probably nine, 10, 11 years old in the early 70s. And there's some similarities, but yet there's a lot of things that are completely different right now. So, how does that change? I guess is my. How do you think it changes? Like, how do we improve? How do uh, yeah, we that's something I was spent a lot of time thinking about because it is such a hard question to answer. And it's very easy to like sit here and be like, people are feeling bad. Right. What's going on? You know, like, ah. but um, I think a lot of it is like agency. So there's this book by Gene Twingy uh, out of NYU, I believe, who it's called iGen and talks about how we've moved from an internal locus of control where we take personal responsibility to an external locus of control um, where we kind of blame everything around us for our personal situations. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I do think that we just kind of there needs to be an assumption of an individual responsibility. But then I also think it is media messaging, like media headlines are very negative. People have lost trust in basically all institutions except for the United Nations. And so I think it's just how do we rebuild trust? 
Um, and I do believe that's through transparency and then giving people the tools that they need to understand the world around them, which is hopefully, you know, the book will play somewhat of a part with that. Yeah, let's talk markets for a second. Obviously, that's how Guy and I really spend our days yeah. um, staring at markets, talking about markets, um, and we really enjoy it. It's funny we had that conversation about a hobby versus you know a profession yeah. and the like. And for us, it's kind of both. I mean, we really enjoy it. We couldn't do what we do every day if we didn't enjoy it. How do you think about um, let, let's call it your demographic? Okay, I'm, I'm assuming that um, a lot of the readers, viewers, and that sort of thing, especially the ones that you reach over social are probably a good deal younger than us, right? And we know what the demographic is of the folks who watch CNBC's Fast Money. How are they thinking differently about markets? We've had these periods where, you know, we've had meme stocks, we've had the gamification of markets, that sort of thing. Obviously, passive investing is a huge thing, but there's a lot of people who really enjoy, whether it's trading individual name, options. You've seen the growth in options since you started trading them. Crypto is a thing. Talk to us a little bit about the mentality of, let's say, this demo of, of your viewers. Do, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, has that changed the game a good deal, too? Because it's, maybe it's something that Guy and I have been really slow to adapt to. We certainly recognize it, but it's changed investing from when we started doing it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two ends of the distribution, right? Like, there's the casino aspect, mm -hmm. which is where GameStop sits. And then I think there's still a lot of young people who don't know how to even start investing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it has to be like kind of a normalization of the two. Like there has to be some way to, some way to meet in the middle. Um, but yeah, I think the view of markets has become that of a casino. A lot of people um, think that they the stocks go up forever, uh, that you can throw a bunch of money in GameStop and, and make a bunch of money. And at some points in the market, that's true. But I, I do think that, you know, fundamentals are disconnected from the market at large. And that has changed how young people think about it. Do they still think it's rigged against them too? Like that that's another thing that we heard a lot and yeah. that was one of the causes of the kind of the meme stock, you know, phenomenon in a way is like let's stick it to the man and mm -hmm. they've been, you know, that sort of thing. Is is that I, something I that you hear a lot? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people think that most institutions are rigged against them. Yeah. And I think that's something I get stuck on quite a bit trying to and you're just like trying to evaluate the human psyche at that point. And that's right. impossible. So it's I struggle with it as well because sometimes I feel I'm like it's patently false. I mean, I think the playing field's probably never been more level. Right, right. And then the flip side of the coin is you see things that are infuriating and you can understand why people say it's a rigged game. So that's something that I, there's something else I struggle with. It's optimism versus pessimism. Now, I think I'm prone, I don't think I know I'm prone to be pessimistic. I was sort of raised in a Wall Street, what can go wrong will go wrong, prepare for the worst, hope for the best type of thing. And that's something that I struggle with. The flip side of that coin is you. I think you're inherently an optimistic person. And I think there's a lot of, I don't know, I think there's a lot of um, power in that. Speak to optimism and the importance of it. Yeah, I mean, um, I think the saying, I'm going to butcher it, but like optimists uh, get paid and pessimists or something. Do you know no, what I'm trying I to say? No, I know exactly what yeah, you mean by that. I, I mean, can't... you know, the pessimists, it's like in the, would you rather be, be right or would you rather make money type yeah. of thing and it's like you know the pessimists the doomsdayers they always sound like the smartest people in the room yeah, yeah. and the reality is sometimes it just pays to be optimistic yeah and I, I think sometimes i'm overly optimistic like i'm probably idealistic sometimes um i try to be as realistic as possible but i have just huge belief in the human spirit and mm -hmm. human resilience and that shows up in how i write about the economy because the economy is humans essentially um, so I try to be as optimistic as possible because I don't think it's useful for my audience to hear pessimism. I think that's all we hear all of the time because that's what sells. And so I just do my best to fight that. And I'm just programmed that way, it's, too. It's so funny, though, that people think that pessimism sells. I mean, I know, you know, if it bleeds, it reads like yeah. that was the old yeah. saying or whatever. But well, like in a lot of like, you know, like optimism to me, you know, people do peg Guy and I as, you know, we go on CNBC. You guys been doing it for 17 years. I've been doing it. For 15 years, and one of the things I realized really early, especially for someone who had CNBC on for the early part of my career without the volume on, right, you turn it up yeah. when news was breaking or something like that, is like there was this universal optimism that often led to groupthink and euphoria. And so for me, the way I was brought up in Wall Street is like, let's pick apart a universal truth that everyone believes in. And that's just as important, you know what I mean, as kind of having the conviction to be long something is understanding how it could go wrong. By the way, um, here's one quote. I just went to the Google machine, as Guy mm. likes to call it, from Winston Churchill. The pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. The optimist 
sees the opportunity in every difficulty. Do you believe with you? Do you agree with that? Yeah, Winston yeah. Churchill? Like, I think it's just like it, w- the difference between the two is what you see from what comes before you, right? Like if you're automatically going to write off everything as very, very bad, like you're just going to see everything as very, very bad. But if you see even the very bad things as an opportunity to grow or get better, um, that that's what enables you. All to right, do can so. I, and I want to make one point here. And guy, you made this point on many occasions. So someone like you, what are you, Gen Z? Is that what? Is yeah, that what I'm are? a cusper. Okay, so you've only known one universal truth in the markets, right? That's basically low interest rates. It's been a great environment to take risk, right? Whether it be in homes, and the irony of that is like the housing market is the thing that caused the financial crisis, which caused low interest rates, which actually caused another bubble in commercial real estate and and residential real estate, but also in the stock market. So other than the COVID crash in March of 2020, which literally lasted like a month and a half and it was 35%, but it was the quickest return back to highs. And then it's been smooth sailing. And even the bear market that we had in 2022, the Fed had your back. It was very orderly. Nothing got crazy other than, and this is a really important point, Kayla, is that the most loved stocks got hit the hardest. NVIDIA was down 75%. Netflix was down 75%. These are from their highs. Tesla was down 75. Meta was down 75%. And that's the thing that I struggle with that people can't see that is that retail never sells, okay? They ride the whole thing down. And people are getting shit rich on NVIDIA right now and they think it will never end. They think it's gonna be the first $5 trillion market cap. So talk to us a little bit about that psyche from a Gen Zer who's never really seen a prolonged bear market or something that looked anything like the financial crisis because that was downright scary. Like why people have this view that things go up forever? Well, I know. I, I mean, right now with the NASDAQ at new all-time highs, with, with NVIDIA just about to overtake Apple in market cap terms, it seems like there is a common euphoria and people in your generation have never seen the flip side of it, I guess yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I I don't know. So you're asking like why would they not sell when things go up? The complacency associated with yeah. basically never – so. I guess what I'll say is I started in 1986. I obviously saw what happened in 1987. I saw what happened in 1999, 2000. But more importantly, I, I lived through 08 and 09, and I lived through it on a television show every night. And one of the things, you know, I still deal with this and probably to my detriment, but I vowed that, you know, if I saw things that concerned me, I was going to make a point of bringing them up. And because some of the feedback we got, you know, in 08, 09, 2010 was, I wish people had told us, you know, some of the things that we only learned in retrospect. So I guess, you know, when you haven't really seen that or lived through it, there's a, again, complacency is, there's just the lack of understanding yeah. is how quickly things can, can go, go pear-shaped. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is like the buy and hold mentality too. Like that's sort of what you're taught mm-hmm. as a young retail investor is to buy and hold and things will go up forever. And so I think that's where maybe some of the complacency comes from. But then, yeah, I think a lot of it is never seeing a lot of a market cycle or always having, you know, a money helicopter come in and and save you. And I think there's an expectation of that, too. Uh, I mean, you even see it um, in like some of my comments when I do talk about stock market stuff. People will be like, I'm so surprised that the stock went down. Like, I didn't think that would ever happen. Right. And but they're companies. Right. And they're prone to that. And like, especially now where investors are kind of flighty. Um, at least the bigger ones. Yeah, it's it's tough. What I have learned is the smartest people tend to be the funniest people. And the people that can make the very esoteric and mundane and sometimes complicated accessible. Um, you're one of those people. Oh. And no, but I'm so my question is it's you walk a fine line. How do how am I gonna be taken seriously? And people understand that I'm actually very bright. And then still maintain the the funny humor aspect of it. How do you how do you sort of walk that? Because it is walking the line. No, it, it's really hard. Yeah, um, especially because because I'm young too, um, or it was like young when I started, I guess. But um, yeah, I actually stopped doing a lot of my funnier videos mm-hmm. because I wanted to sh- like write a book and uh, no, I understand. wanted to be taken seriously, and um, it, it's been really hard. Like, uh, luckily, the industry has been really welcoming. But at first, like, nobody wanted me anywhere near anything. Um, And so it is a really fine line to walk. But I think that the markets can be really fun and the economy can't. Like, you all do a good job at this. Like, it can be funny. It should be, probably. 
Um, we right? have more fun, I think, on this on the TV show. I mean, we try to be very serious about like our commentary, and you know, we don't make recommendations, but we talk about things that we're involved in, the way we're perceiving them. You know, like we have some fun. It has to be fun in that um, you know, like you couldn't do like there's nobody on TikTok that works that's really serious. You know what I mean? Like it has to be something that's engaging, right? It has to be authentic and the like. So we have fun on TV. I mean. You know, when we do this stuff, um, we'd like to have fun, but uh, oftentimes we have a I think mission it's important, to deliver. You know, we're not splitting the atom, yeah. right? And I think I'll say this: as it's a lot easier as a man than as a woman. I mean, that's just the unfortunate reality of the world we live in. You know, I can say things, and it's funny or it's clever, and you know, Karen may say something and viewed as an entirely different way, and that's unfortunate. So I have a great respect, especially for women that are on the medium that can be authentic to themselves, be funny, be clever, and yet still be really smart. I guess that's sort of the essence of my question. And I understand your sort of reticence or reluctance to sort of continue down that path when you wanted to be taken seriously. And we're going to talk about your book. But, you know, I think it's important. You know, people say, how do you do the TV thing? And, and not that I'm good at it, but what I tell people is be yourself because everybody else has already been taken. No, I, I think about that with my content too. I think that's why it resonates uh because I'm just like sitting in my room and like talking to a camera and like mm -hmm. you can see my dog sometimes. Like it's like, you know, it's very low budget. <laughs> and uh, I just try to be myself and like I do crack jokes in the videos and I have a bunch of drawings like my whiteboard. Um, and so I try to, to make it as much of how I would want my style to look like as possible. But yeah, I've, I've hesitated away from some funny well, stuff. Well, a lot of people try. You succeed. So let's go oh, to the thanks. book because it's it's a quantum leap when you decide, you know, you're going to go through and it's to a certain extent, it can be an ordeal, but just the time consumption that's required to write a book. So yeah. what was the genesis and what was sort of that catalyst that said, okay, I'm going to do this now? Well, I mean, I've always wanted to, to write a book. Like when I was eight, I wrote this book about a little penguin and um, like all throughout my childhood, I was writing little books that my mom would publish. Um, and then when I wrote this Fab Session piece for the New York Times opinion section, mm -hmm. In July 2022, Penguin Random House approached me and they're like, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, yes. And uh, I really wanted a static place that people would go to to get the tools about the economy. Um, so the book breaks down inflation, labor market, GDP, fiscal policy, monetary policy, um, how the Federal Reserve works, how money works. And it's just meant to be a guide to refer back to when um, when you're just trying to understand what's going on. What did you learn that you didn't know or surprised you as you went down this path? It's hard to write a book. <laughs> um, and I think also, like, I was just so used to doing 90-second videos. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I had this really big project in front of me. Um, but I also learned quite a bit about the history of banking and, like, the history of money. And that was really fascinating just to tie everything back to, like, where we are now. I feel like having a good grasp of the history just as an economist or somebody who studies the economy is really important. So if you watch Fast Money with any regularity or watch any of the things that we do, I am no fan of the Federal Reserve. I'm extraordinarily outspoken about it. I think they've overstayed their welcome and they've become too sort of ingrained in our economy. That's just my opinion. Did you learn anything about sort of the, again, the genesis of the Federal Reserve back way back when and now the growth and the largesse that they now I, it's all you talk about too big to fail. I mean, that's the Federal Reserve. Yeah, no, things have changed quite a bit since 1913 for sure. I mean, I think like the interesting thing that the Fed is going to have to grapple with, and I, I suppose it ties into your point about like what is the role, is um, the tools probably don't work the way that they want them to. I think like maybe interest rates aren't as impactful for fighting inflation. Like most of the inflation recovery that we've had has been because of a normalization of supply and mm -hmm. demand not because of rates. In fact, rates have probably, higher rates have made things worse in terms of inflationary pressure because of the housing crisis that we're facing, which is most of the consumer price index prints. Um, so I, I think that's the issue that the Fed is going to have to face is, you know, what, do, you know, who are you if your toolkit maybe isn't that impactful? It's fast. I'm, I'm so with you on that. And maybe, you know, again, I'll say this, Jerome Powell notwithstanding, I mean, these are mostly academics if you think about it. And what works in a textbook a lot of times doesn't work in real life. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see whatever the next administration is, whether it's a continuation of the Biden administration or another Trump administration, what the role of the Federal Reserve and what it's going to look like, I guess, going forward. So I guess my next question to you is how important, forget about politics, just in terms of the economy, 
do you think this election coming up in November is? I think every election is pretty important. A hundred percent. I agree with that. But some rise to a level of, you know, and it's interesting because we had Steve Eisman on our podcast and he came on Fast Money. He doesn't think necessarily either way moves the needle. I don't agree with that. But oh. you know, understanding that each election is important, I would think this the importance of our economy you know, this might be one of the most important elections, if not the most important election we'll face. Yeah, I think there there's two very different approaches to running the country that we're facing um, and two very different approaches to trade policy, mm-hmm. two very different approaches to even managing the Federal Reserve. Like I know Trump has said that he would like become president of the Fed or like something like that. He's made um, some interesting comments. Con- yeah. Yes. And so I think it's um, and like I think just also with the tension that exists in the U.S. right now, the uncertainty um, it's just going to be really important to figure out who who's going to lead the country. I, I'm truly amazed um, that so many, let's call it, leaders in 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 finance and business um, are are going the opposite way. Listen, the Biden administration has not done themselves any favors with all the regulatory. You know, they, they've really alienated whether it be initially the energy space, but in big tech and that sort of thing. But when you think about if you are the, the leader of a, a big real estate um, investment company or a large bank or anything like that. You want the world to want to do business in your country, right? You want manufacturing here. You want, um, you know, brands that do well around the world. And when you think about, you know, obviously January 6th, that was, to me, a very seminal moment. So I find it really interesting that so many business leaders are going to gravitate back towards less regulation, lower taxes, all that sort of stuff to me. And I don't, I just don't think that's, being talked to uh, or talked about a lot. And then the other aspect of that is the deficit. You know what I mean? And I think one thing that people, again, you know, the IRA, was it really an Inflation Reduction Act? If anything, it actually was very inflationary. You know what I mean? So I think there's problems on both sides. And I agree with Guy that this is probably the most important election of my lifetime. But that being said, I think almost every election from here on out is going to be that because we have these conflicting views about how things should be run. So um, again, how do you think about like, I, I just want to throw in the deficit because this is one that people, Gen Zers should be really focused on because I think well, the people, debt, I mean, the, 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 yes, the deficit spending and the, the national deficit debt, spending those two de- yeah. things uh, like, is that something that you find people of your generation focused on? Do they feel like they're getting a raw deal here? I mean, I, I think it's definitely a level of concern, especially now that rates are high because the mm-hmm. Fed's been raising them to battle inflation, like interest payments are high on the debt. And that, I think when debt goes towards non-productive use it, use cases such as paying interest, right. um, that's when it's really not so good debt. And I think that's kind of what is most concerning about the situation that we're facing is like, who knows when rates are going to be cut? Maybe December, but um, the the interest payments are going to continue to balloon as the debt balloons. It's it's interesting and it's an entirely different conversation. But you know what will rate cuts? You know, I think there are a lot of people that believe rate cuts are the the panacea that this economy needs right now, and that will cure all the ills. I'm not one of those people, by the way, but we'll see how it plays out. In terms of the book, how are people finding it? You're getting out there, you're doing podcasts like this, you're obviously, you're on the road now. I've seen a lot on social media, a lot of really interesting people that a year or so ago, you would have said, holy shit, I can't believe this person is not only reading my book, but making comments. No, it's, no, it's true, yeah. Because I've lived yeah. through a similar thing. Like, oh, I can't believe this person watches our show. So speak to that, the impact yeah. that you're having and the reach that you've had and then subsequently what this book is going to do. Yeah, no, it, it's been really amazing. So uh, the book came out yesterday at the time of recording, and uh, I was so nervous going into it because you just never know like what's mm-hmm. going to happen. But yeah, the the feedback has been really amazing. And somebody, Derek Thompson, who I really respect, said that the book was a marvel, which I was like, oh my gosh, that's that's so kind. Um, So yeah, the feedback has been awesome. I think people are still working through it since it just came out. But um, so far, like everybody who got an advanced copy has has been super receptive and and complimentary. And I think it's just like a fun way to read about the economy. There's 60 illustrations. Um, The language is very accessible. It's kind of something you can refer back to. It's not meant to be really dense and heavy and thick. It's meant to take the theory of the economy, right? That that sometimes can be not so useful 
and just apply it to the real world. So I'm hoping that it, it does. It's going to be summer reading for my two daughters, Ellie mm-hmm. and Alex. Oh. So by the way, and I'm going to get each of them one, and hopefully you'll come back and you'll sign one. Oh, of course, right, I would Kyla, love to. Well, uh, listen, you guys know where to find the book. It would be wherever you get books. Guy. Well, I you mean, still go I to go the Barnes to, and I Nobles. go to. I do. She was just at the Union Square Barnes I was and Nobles. The, I saw yeah. that. No, I go to F and my, my, my girls read tons of books, and they love that bookstore. By yeah, the way, it's, it's still a good a big bookstore. One. Yeah. So, so just give it to your kids. Give it to anybody. Right, a hundred percent. You should absolutely read this book. Here's a question before we get out of here, and I struggle with this one as well. Are you proud of yourself? I mean, I know that sounds like a really oh. odd question. No, but I think you know, I I I want to be proud of myself sometimes, but I'm I'm my own worst critic. So. You know, think about where you are now. You've written this book. Um, a lot of doors going to open up. How do you feel about things? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think sometimes I, I struggle with like imposter syndrome and I'm mm-hmm. very critical of myself too. And so I think about like what little Kyla would think. And so like eight-year-old Kyla who wrote a book about a penguin would be extremely excited for right. what, what I've done. And I really am just hoping that, you know, the book reaches another little Kyla who gets inspired by that. That's like that's when I would be proud of of what the book has accomplished. Well, we'll do anything we can to help make that 100% goal <laughs> achievable. You know, we'll push on our end for sure. But Thanks. I'm glad we we're able to meet. I'm glad you came in. Dan's got a well, question. Well, here, I think. no, this is one. This is an easy one for the first 50 people that leave a review. There you go. For on the tape podcast, oh. take a screenshot. It doesn't have to be a five star, as guy likes to no, say. Just take a but screenshot. Little, take a screenshot. Send it to contact at risk reversal, and we're going to send you a copy oh. for free. 100%. Of book how about that we look and after the first 50 do it hopefully we'll get another 50 to do and we'll keep doing it how's that like that's the way we'll do it in perpetuity just read the book people (laughs) and and review the podcast okay follow her all right all right thanks let's kyla thanks so much so much thank you continued success we look forward to seeing what you're doing in the future thank you i appreciate it 